Um, okay. Yes, that would be lovely. That would be lovely, thanks. Okay, um, sort of, of moving on. Um, as, as we said yesterday, part of the, the um, part of what we're attempting <coughs> is to part of, part of what we're attempting is to try and prod at the concept of infrastructure from um, as many perspectives as possible in order to in a way to refuse its its capacity to be infrastructural, right? So there's there's a sort of way in which rather than sit in judgment on it um, or criticize it or kind of, of critically view it as a structure. And in that sense, one of the things that really interested me about um, both of today's presentations uh, was the notion of being in the midst of it, right? I think I think that um, both affectively and structurally, in both of the presentations that we heard this afternoon, the the sort of key element was a, a position of being in the midst of it. So what Jean-Louis Delt calls a state of being deviced, right? So that of being deviced, right? So one is devised. Um, and I, I, I was sort of, of thinking as I was listening um, to these two presentations, and I don't know if this happens to the rest of you, but most of the time, the, I certainly have very belated recognitions of understanding why I do what I do, right? So it, there's a kind of always a, a, a movement forward in doing something and then a kind of long period of recognition of why it actually might be worth doing. And I think that that uh, one of the things that I kind of understood after we, the four of us have kind of attempted to, to uh, poke at infrastructure has been the fact that this, for me, affects a transition from a state of knowing what my ground is to a state of not knowing what my ground is. So let's, uh, let's say in, in, in sort of my field of operations of being, I, I don't know what I am, but maybe a critical epistemologist is what I am. Um, I think for a very long time, I knew what the ground from which I was operating was. And I, I'm beginning to understand that the point of infrastructure is to begin to operate from unknown ground. So not, not to be able to name it, articulate it, and so on. And the, the, that opens up epistemologically, cognitively, a whole set of, of, of possibilities. So. Uh, what, one of the things I wanted to sort of think about is really maybe pull a few points from both of your presentations together around this notion of being in the midst of it. Now, Stefano, you were the other person hearing it from the outside, as it were, so you might have some other kind of, of, of sense of what, what needs to, to be done. I, I mean, that's strikes me like a good, um, a good direction. I, the thing that came across to me in both of the presentations was um, just a certain sense of the wealth of infrastructure that already exists in our world, whether it's uh, the, the, the wealth of performance that was evident in Adrian's or the, or the physical wealth that was evident in all its misuses in, in your presentation, Louis. So I, I'm, I'm I, I understand the notion of of feeling like there's a ground uh, shifting on us in certain ways. At the same time, I don't want to lose sight of uh, other political tra traditions of hacking, squatting, occupying. Um, I, I'm not willing to cede all of that infrastructure uh, to, to somebody else. Um, so, so I'd I'd like to bear that in mind at the same time. Uh, but but otherwise, my interest is to hear more from you guys and to hear from everybody else about this. Um, 
Well, it's, it's, it's pretty paradoxical in relationship to the, the particular um, strategies of inhabitation and a sense of kind of occupation in a, in a gallery space uh, because, of course, those, uh, those experiments, those uh, conditions of instability are themselves founded on, uh, you know, one of the last uh, good uh, structures of state funding for the arts. I guess it's Germany and, and, and France still left in Europe. Um, and so, uh, you know, in a sense, the, um, the radicality of those uh, gestures, which really destructure uh, fabrics, are, are founded on that, uh, that, uh, that affluence, in a, in a sense, that uh, capacity. Um, but at the same time, what I'm really aware of is that it doesn't uh, necessarily make it any uh, easier. Uh, that that um, uh, my my sense of uh, the process for people engaged uh, in this collaborative, uh, cre creative, and discursive work, uh, but also for those people engaged in the inhabitation who are workers uh, within the institution, is that it was extremely fraught and pr and problematic, and actually for some of the uh, contributing artists. So the the thick of it there is really um, a couple of things. It's a, uh, a kind of thick uh, trouble where habitual uh, practices that are inscribed and uh, sedimented within institutional contexts become really profoundly problematized. So for instance, the people who work the galleries who's, who, who, uh, for whom their work is, a, is in a sense a kind of form of policing uh, a, f a form of uh, protection of of material goods and a monitoring of, uh, of of interactive relations between people and things uh, were put in enormously complex situations where there's suddenly a different kind of caretaking uh, going on, a different kind of sp space of license. Um, but uh, also interestingly, I think it it generates uh, really huge uh, legal. Uh, problems for the condition of the artwork itself, particularly those artworks which were resolved into objects, into material objects. So for some of those contributing artists, not, not I would say, Simone Forti, but for others who were en engaged in uh, production of uh, artifacts, residues of performance works that are now highly valuable, to have people fucking around with those things, to have them tipping up display tables, breaking display tables with them on, etc., creates a whole kind of other situation with, um, you know, with, with the commodity. Um, so um, for me, that's what the, the thick of these questions is about as well, and, and being uh, not just about the experiential relays that uh, the, um, the conditions generate. Um. About these other traditions and uh, kind of alternative kind of histories and alternative uh, futures, I've got two examples in mind. One is the, the, the brilliant piece out in the foyer, the, um, the Stor de l'Art piece on Perestroika, because I think it's, it's, it's a wonderful, it's just interesting the, the, the way in which this work is only being done, I think, in, in a cultural institution. That, this, that, that, that kind of problem of not just the history of uh, the recent past, but that nobody is really doing uh, kind of an analysis, the kind of counterfactual to that, about why does, as Mark said, history proceed by its bad side, you know? <laughs> um, uh, and that, that seems to be um, a very interesting way of thinking about utopianism, not, not just as in terms of kind of dystopianism, about, you know, we're all fucked and we're all kind of bonded to this kind of infrastructural relations of neoliberalism. But what are the procedures? You know, if we think about, you know, an American crime series, what, you know, uh, they call them police procedural. And one of the interesting things about the thriller format, that, and that's something that's been done very well, I think, in TV shows like The Wire, is that you think about the urban as, uh, as a set of kind of building blocks, not just of the physical infrastructure of the city, but a set of institutional relations that can be explored in order to bring to light 
the reasons why there is a certain logic to to power and i think that's what's interesting about the uh you know if i was thinking about a relationship between the store la piece and um and also uh the hans hacker stuff and also like harvey's kind of analysis uh, geographical analysis, they kind of link up, I think, with this kind of interesting kind of approach that we've got now of cognitive mapping in um, in popular American TV about understanding where power is based. But this notion of cognitive mapping um, ends is where Jameson, Frederick Jameson, ends up in in his big book on postmodernism, which is written in 1990. And it ends on a kind of poignant note, and a very ambiguous note, because he references another history you know it's a kind of it's it's another revolution a kind of an, an a nearly actually existing form of communism in the US that not many people have heard about which is the uh, the work and the struggle of uh, the Dodge Revolutionary Union movement and the League of Revolutionary Black Workers in the late 60s and the early 1970s and Jameson says, you know, there was something very interesting about their struggles, documented in a book called Detroit, I Do Mind Dying, about the way in which their response was um, not that, oh, the city has fallen off the kind of map of global international competitiveness, but that the way in which the auto plants and the unions and the police force at a state city level integrated as a kind of abstract machine around racism in order to abstract surplus value. They organized around that in order to present a different type of politics which was urban and which was about constantly counteracting that. Now Jameson says it's poignant because God there was something you know that was actually, that, that, that looks like a kind of an urban revolution which generates a, a 1980s, which looks very different to the, to the era of Reagan. But he says, oh, it didn't work, but actually the tragedy of it gives us a certain kind of resonance. And I think the fact that it's, it's been forgotten is, is, is something that needs to be um, seen not as, um, as something which is poignant and tragic, but actually it needs to be kind of reanimated, not as something which is tragic, which is the story that we have now at places like Detroit or many other industrial cities. Not the tragedy of that becoming revolutionary moment, but there, there needs to be a requirement to find forms of cultural production which don't uh, certify them with or toe tag them with that, <laughs> that notion of tragedy. Uh, it's finding something exciting and fundamentally political and driving and growth providing about this, but not in this sense of pure economic exploitation. I mean, this this kind of segues into the next thing that I, I wanted to ask Adrian and Luis. Isn't what you're saying, doesn't it require, in a way, a change of infrastructure in terms of the location? So to take these kind of revolutionary trajectories um, and reanimate them and, and make them a sort of... Con living in the contemporary in some way requires moving them from one infrastructure to another because in in the in the original one they don't have continuity mm. but the and in a way it it sort of, of I was I wanted to ask you a lot of what I want to ask I don't quite know how to formulate but Luis you were talking about the fact that capitalism requires spatial fixes to resolve the relations between capital, labor, and land, right? So you were talking about this this notion of a spatial fix, which is not really building a building. Yeah. building financial it's building financial institutions, but it's also building building symbolic landscapes. It's 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 sort of, of, and I was I was wondering, I didn't know Adrian that you're the best person to ask about this, but I'll ask you anyway. The the whether whether the, whether we've not equally within the arenas of culture become addicted to affective fixes or experiential fixes. The, the, I was thinking, I have a bugbear about programmers, I, I, I'm about sort of programmers and cultural institutions and this um, perfectly balanced diet of 
you know, sort of two Marxist revolutionaries, <laughs> one critical theorist, one sort of, of radical aesthetician, you know, one urban planner, and an architect um, that kind of make up the 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 you know the balance of 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 a good diet within a cultural institution, and that this seems to me to be the flip side of what you're ca calling a spatial fix. This is an experiential fix or an affective okay. fix. And um, that, but what's driving both of these is exactly the same. Yeah. That doesn't, that doesn't mean, of course, that the experiences are, are not different right? and are differently produced. I mean, what, what's interesting to me about these uh, uh, experiments uh, in inhabitation uh, and occupation of space, of, of durational, sustained, creative living in spaces, is that they are actually somewhat haunted. Uh, well, two things. One is engagement with the public in, in this particular context, because what happens is the work tends to uh, pass into the illegible and into the invisible in particular ways, because the challenge to... Uh, the challenge uh, to traditions and to uh, expectations of spectatorship is so tough, actually, that I wonder then about the uh, accessibility of the experience itself. So that that for me is is uh, one question that what what I experienced in those contexts is people taking being taken up by experiences and there being a kind of return something to do i think with the force of durations which is that they require mirror durations of their witnesses that they 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 demand that you come live with them in some way or another um but i i was thinking also about the, the phrase that you were um talking about uh, yesterday in terms of institutions that are uh, too big to fail. And for me, uh, I, I'm, I'm, I wondered if this was a context in where it was a little bit too big uh, to fail and that it did fail. And, um, and so I, there, there is a sense for me in which these kinds of experimentations have, uh, at the, in the current moment, have limits of scale. And uh, and obviously they 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 have temporal limits. I mean they're exceedingly temporary transformations, but I think they're generative of other temporalities. Uh, what you were saying, Iris, about the um, a kind of balanced curatorial kind of diet. Um, I, I gave a talk different to this one uh, at the Institute of Contemporary Arts a couple of years ago. They were doing something on education and knowledge and. Um, and 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 I, I thought I was being brought along as as to to offer a kind of a neo-Marxist type analysis, right, of of institutions about the way in which institutions operate and the way in which they kind of triangulate the public sphere, and uh, and, and and project the, uh, the their their value onto the public sphere. So I thought I was doing something kind of critical about the the cultural infrastructure side of the equation. And then at the end of it, somebody who came up to me who was a management consultant who was working because at the time I think the gallery was in a process of restructuring. So it may have been your Price Waterhouse Cooper guy that I'm so fond of. Um, but he came up to me and said, oh, that was great. That was really, really good stuff because I think there's a lot in there that I can use to restructure the institution. And I didn't realize that the knowledge had that cognitive <laughs> dimension, that valence <laughs> to it, right? So I suppose the, the first part of your question then about the, al the alternative infrastructures, maybe, we could, that maybe that's a nice way to kind of throw it out because I think it's a huge, massive question. You know, uh, and I think it's linked to the story lot of stuff about why, why don't we get history? <laughs> proceeding by its good side, you know. Why don't we have a total, <laughs> not utopia, but why don't we have a kind of uh, a form of production and reproduction which works in a more equitable way? I think that's a good way to open it up. What what infrastructure means in that context, but then but this issue around of um, the kind of the valency of cultural infrastructure in generating and conditioning and forming a pretext of constant capital restructuring 
but that it is now being concentrated to the individual point of uh, not you as a consumer, but you as a cultural producer, and that everybody's expected to be a cultural producer if they're if they're entitled to have any kind of good standard of living in the future. I think is uh, is is a strange and troubling prospect. Um. I, I wanted to just to say one thing about trying to clarify what I, where I started around being interested in the way that you put me in mind of the, uh, being in the midst of a certain kind of wealth. Um, you know, it seemed, I, I have a, during the kind of student movements recently in, in London, which you know, now seem a distant memory, uh, I had a PhD student called Camille Barbagallo who was absolutely fearless around kind of um, organizing, and she produced these series of pamphlets she gave out, and they basically uh, taught students how to shoplift, how to, uh, how to marry a migrant, and they were like got how-to guides, right? And, um, and finally, she was going to produce one called How to Steal Electricity, and she decided not to, because she was afraid people would get electrocuted. And, and it's, it strikes me that, that one of the issues to be grappled with is, uh, is how, uh, how we get to the point where we can't have any involvement with infrastructure. So I don't want to take it back in the sense of what I was talking about yesterday. You know, I don't want to have some electronic decision making about who gets lights and when and that. Like, I'm not interested in that. But I want to be able to have a kind of involvement with this, with this wealth that enables people to do things. And if I, if you think about like, um, you know, if you think about uh, the, the failure of urban fixes in the developing world, which you know well, Lou, I mean, when you build buildings in Manila or in Jakarta, you don't solve something. You know, you get new, you get new slums, you get new ghettos, and, 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 and people who work in urban poor movements in, in places like that, they're trying to just make some articulation between that. So the spatial fix that works because it's, it does something cognitive for people and they think they're creative workers inside of it or whatever the case that we can see in Dubai or in, in Birmingham, that doesn't work in Manila. It doesn't work in Jakarta. There's a that totally exclusionary kind of uh, process. And so I think one of the things to think about is, is how we could get back to the point, uh, as I was saying before, where where infrastructure becomes some, this kind of powerful thing that we leverage because we can have a, we can touch it without it being ours, uh, without imagining that we we can we can think all of it. And I think this this notion of not being able to think the totality of of uh, you know is a is a more interesting form of thinking totality. First of all, right? Then, and you know, so for instance, uh, you know the. Uh, uh, I Do Mind Dying, uh, the title of the Revolutionary uh, Black Workers, that, the first part of that line is, uh, I, I don't mind working, but I do mind dying, right? So it's about a, it's about a... It's speaking to the foreman. It's yeah, song. yeah, it's a song, part of a tradition, a very distinct tradition of Detroit blues. And, uh, and you know, what he's talking about is that his, his relationship with infrastructure is deadly. Right, he has a deadly, which is the relationship of people who live, you know, in Manila, Manila or Jakarta, or on hillsides to infrastructure as well. Right, so, so on the one hand, there's this vast sort of wealth, but our ability to to touch it, and by touching that, touch something that is far beyond. And this is where I was thinking also some of the spirited things that you were talking about. This seems to me maybe a, a place that we could think about uh, bringing together my obviously very materialist sense of infrastructure and what I been hearing a bit in 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 all of your uh, presentations um, but again I, I I think Louis is right that we should hear from and, and, everybody well, and the other thing that occurred to me is the potential of bringing back something like detonement you know of of, of um, a kind of situationist notion a psychogeographical notion of detonement not spatial in this in in this instance but infrastructural where one sort of of is able to interact with several take dimensions of several to make up a kind of of parallel or lateral kind of environment okay i think maybe this this is the moment to open it up and we already have 
one person raring to go. It says, uh, this is the sound of the war on the poor. It's the, um, it's the slogan for the, the sound works outside. Um, and I, I wanted to thank you for the conversations um, so, so far. And I wanted to ask, um, uh, I wanted to really perhaps comment on something and then um, perhaps ask uh, your reflections or your responses to, to the, 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 the speculations that are going on. And that is, one of the things is that I'm, I'm trying to not understand um, this re review of what infrastructure may be or may, may, uh, could be broken down as, um, as, um, as so not something as something very monolithic or, or just uh, some, this homogeneous mass, and I'm trying to think of the different levels of infrastructure. And so, if we were to rethink r infrastructure, particularly in terms of urban, urban contexts, right? I mean, are we talking about the architects, the signature architects? Are we talking about the urban planners, the urban theorists, or are we talking actually about the staff, uh, the staff who will, um, who will, who who will uh, clean and do the housekeeping for those um, um, spaces in Dubai, right? So, so I, I, that was. I was just wanted to put that out there um, because I think that when we're talking about um, the, the amount of wealth in these these uh, new new um, high rises and new towers that are displacing these populations that are even sort of um, ostracizing other populations that um, I can't help but think about if they are sort of speculative spaces in terms of speculation, then we kind of re return to this idea of risk, right? And part of the risk and the speculation is that the occupancy rate for these towers, for these well, very wealthy um, endroits, are, are uh, the occupancy rate is a completely different set of parameters than the occupation or the occupy movement, um, the the tenants for, and yet they are. Are totally linked together, right? The um, the 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 the, um, the fact that um, many of these um, apartment towers that are seen as um, investments are empty, and yet there is an occupy movement on the ground, right? And so there's a kind of disparity I wanted to think about. Um, and so if I were to ask a question, perhaps to bring that together, there is a consideration of um, uh, this museum in Guangzhou in China. Um, called the Times Museum. I don't know if you've heard of this um, model, Ram Kulhas, and um, it's basically a T-struck museum that is embedded in one of these high, high, high um, these high tower residential towers, right? So you have the museum in this very luxury condo tower, right? So I might wonder, like, in terms of thinking about the levels of how you can do even start critiquing the infrastructure around this hybrid model that involves a museum, uh, whatever you could possibly do in a condo complex. Um, and in a condo complex that has um, um, possibly um, places, spaces to live that are uninhabited because they are far beyond um, some places that um, the ordinary person could afford. Maybe start from there, thank you. Um, okay, I've probably got three things, but I probably won't cover all of them. <laughs> so I'll maybe just do two. Uh, one about Occupy in London. One of the interesting things about that is the kind of, um, if you think about the, uh, the, the, the spatial pathology of the Occupy protest, they, they effectively were kind of bounced off uh, an attempt to occupy Paternoster Square, which is where the, the, the new stock exchange is. Uh, but the policing of Paternoster Square is so kind of efficient, and and it's a you know it's a, it's a it's a pristine, self-integrated, uh, compact kind of real estate asset. It's a shopping centre. It's a commercial environment owned by an institutional investor company, and uh, and and so the occupiers couldn't get into that right. So, but they're bounced off onto the the f uh, a free a piece of free space owned by the Church of England that would allow them the opportunity to protest. So I think there's something quite interesting in a way about there's a kind of infrastructure that that revealed. You know, there's a, there's a very strong infrastructural resistance to any type of colonization of a particular type of real estate asset, 
uh, commercial uh, production retail complex. And then there is another type of institution which is supposed to be supposed to be for the public, which provides some uh, some area of kind of permeability for political discussion and debate. So just understanding that that there are these kind of weak lines, of re there are these weak lines of resistance within the city is is quite important. The thing about um, Rem Cool has, um, you know, <laughs> right. Yeah, well, let's not talk about that. But you know, the, the, there's there's something I, I I started. I was working. I was doing architectural history uh, as as a kind of masters, and got just kind of bored really of cultural theory, uh, and, and not necessarily bored about postmodernism, even though nobody talks about that anymore. Um, it wasn't that. It was just this kind of lack of engagement with political uh, economy, and it seems like it hasn't been worked through. Even though, obviously, there is a kind of an infrastructural fix, an urban spatial fix for capital, yeah, and it works in a very totalizing way because, you know, you have uh, financiers, you have developers, you have, uh, uh, you may not have heard of them, but project managers, construction management that works on the logistics of assembling and and basically pricing the risks of building projects. And that the, the, the these come together, and these have been produced, these kind of institutions, and they come together, and, and they make the landscape work for financial services, both providing them with office space, but also providing those people who use financial services the most, the wealthy, um, with, with kind of assets. And I think there's, there, there's a lot of work that I think needs to be done and, and I know I ended up talking about Dubai, and I, I really don't like talking about Dubai because it kind of puts us off the scent, really. Um, but there is something about understanding the way in which uh, the built environment, uh, fixed capital, is used as a way of kind of managing wealth and concentrating and centralizing wealth and power. And I think that, that, is, a, that is a really ripe, obvious, interesting point to put into the public arena, the public... For, for public discussion, because the, the way in which the, uh, the economy is rationalized to us as political subjects is still about, I'm talking in a UK context, home ownership. So there is actually a continuity, I think, between you know, people in Manila or people in kind of slums. The way in which they go about their daily business, maybe, or thinking about how to get by, is that you adapt your, your dwelling and you, p you put an extra room on it so you can provide somebody shelter. You know, there's a kind of a rent model in that about the way in which you can generate some kind of surplus. Well, that kind of model actually works in the more sophisticated example of the UK. The buy-to-let rent model was essentially about acquiring property so you could live off rents and getting into debt in order to live off rent and have a kind of a rentier economy. Um, so I think the way in which these kind of st structures at the level of not necessarily physical infrastructure, uh, but the way in which physical infrastructure, whether it's housing or whether it's bridges or whether it's cultural institutions, have been kind of mobilized as real estate assets, i.e. financial instruments, is a type of infrastructure that um, needs to be brought, uh, politicized. Yeah, it needs to be politicized. Sorry if I cannot uh, formulate my question coherently because the, the, there are so many subtle undercurrents with it. Um, uh, but I was very much impressed by the last footage of yours with this lifestyle, <laughs> um, lifestyles. Um, and um, my question would be, um, uh, this passage uh, manifests that uh, uh, life is completely determined by uh, by the set of infrastructures, and I was asking this question yesterday. Uh, I, I asked Irit this question: whether we can say that life is completely identified nowadays with the infrastructure, or there could be some life that is not 
uh, completely reduced to infrastructure. And my question would be the same. Um, how, do you think, how do you think, can we operate with this notion of life at all? Um, or uh, if life is identified with infrastructure, it means that life is capitalism, and capitalism is life. And if there had been any life, there had been life only before capitalism. So how should we operate with this notion of life in the frame when everything is infrastructure? Oh, I have no idea about that, so maybe you could. <laughs> Difficulty. This is the difficulty that I'm yeah. I'm dealing with, uh, and but I'm not inclined to a kind of totalizing thought uh, around this uh, domination of uh, of life force uh, by capital, by infrastructure, and and that in a sense was why the emphasis is. I mean, I'm trying to work this sort of tension between. Um, one kind of infrastructure that is an institutional infrastructure um, that is a particular s set of materialities and then another kind of uh, infrastructure that is uh, uh, for me a social uh, fabric a kind of trans historical mm. trans generational uh, social fabric which is to do with um, spirit which might be something of a dirty word, but an important word, I think, um, uh, or at least uh, spiritedness. And I think this is, you know, that this is. Uh, so how something. would you put it? A spirited infrastructure, or how would you term it? How would you? Yeah, that that would be a, a lovely phrase for it. I don't know what I'm terming it yet because I'm I'm just trying to to find it. But I'm, what I'm seeing in it is that uh, uh, that force that exceeds the I and co connects with the we. And this is a, a same force that uh, that travels across uh, the collective work of, uh, of Occupy and uh, collective artistic collaborations inside institutions that are attempting to transform and destructure them. Um, and it is that, that uh, uh, force which is uh, the means through which conjunctions and disjunctions and transformations uh, take take place. Uh, the other kind of um, the, the kind of consistencies of psychic and and uh, uh, social uh, life. Um, so I, you know, I'm interested in that that question of spiritedness. I'm trying to avoid thinking it in any. Uh, kind of uh, religious uh, framework. It is to do with uh, materialities, materialities of bodies and of uh, uh, of practices and forces that travel effectively across them between uh, uh, individuals across time and across institutional divides. Um, but I don't have the language yet to talk about that. I'm sure Irit and Stefano have a, a much better language to talk about this life of a uh, spirit in culture and, in fact, of course, the spirit of capitalism, which is uh, also a kind of spirit. Well, I'm, I'm really struck by, um, you know, in, in several moments, the, the, the emergence of a kind of live legacy of a moment of radical potential, and then the need to not produce it in a historically linear kind of mode, um, but to 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 allow it um, to kind of of, of cross pollinate elsewhere and otherwise, and. Um, and, and and I think that is. I mean, I, I was very struck, Stefano, by what you said about the um, the Detroit, the the opening line of the song of the Detroit labor uh, movement, and the the um, that that kind of trajectory of the proximity of that which enables life and takes life away. You know that that is this kind of of, of of duality, and you what what do you do with that? Do you do you keep it as a kind of romantic herald, or do you make it? And in a way, 
I think thinking infrastructure is maybe a way of allowing kind of continuity that is not within a historical linear trajectory where we revisit moments. And I, I, I think more and more that one of the potentials within infrastructure is endless kind of co-inhabitations, spatial, historical, metaphorical, material, that maybe break down um, some of the the so, some of, of 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 the ways in which increasingly I'm beginning to understand neoliberalism has relegated radicality to the past or incursions of the past into this moment, but always incursions of of, of the past into this moment. Um, oh, can I just? Because uh, I think it links up with your point. Uh, just to, I'm not going to sing the song, <laughs> all right? But I think it goes, um, please, Mr. Foreman, uh, close. So this Detroit, I do mind dying song. So please, Mr. Foreman, close down, uh, slow, slow down, down yeah. slow down. Yeah. S it's important this point. Slow down your assembly line, uh, please, Mr. Foreman, slow down. I, no, I don't mind working, but I do mind dying. Yeah. And it, that seems to me to be um, an interesting point, and it kind of maps on to another problem, which is um, you know, the way in which uh, European Marxist intellectuals looked at the American industrial experience, you know, the way Lenin was looking at Fordism, and the way Gramsci was kind of wrestling with what Fordism is. You know, you're talking about the Soviets and the electrification, you know. This infrastructure point is absolutely fundamental. It's an open question. Is it just simply, you know, taking the tools and then using them so that history proceeds in a different way? You know, this is this is so the Google point, right? And the, and it's very interesting that the kind of the Arab Revolution uh, in in Egypt. It's I think it was a, a, a Google employee. Was it Google? Yeah, but anyway, and, and then it was used as a piece of advertising. Say, this is how emancipating, you know, new technology is because it drives revolution. So it's a kind of, and I think it's a similar question to the kind of Gramsci kind of question or the Lenin question, actually, about well, if you have the, you know, if you have to give the technology, and if you have access to the judicial system, and you have a say on how private property rights are kind of distributed. You know, is that is that enough? Um, and I think this is a, this is maybe a, uh, an interesting way of thinking about the problem that infrastructure presents to us. Uh, is infrastructure already kind of pre-formatted so that it reproduces itself in a particular direction? Sorry, one small comment. If there is good infrastructure and bad infrastructure, why why delegating? Uh, uh, so many epistemological creativities to this term. Uh, I, I ask this because uh, there had been many efforts to get rid of this notion. Um, uh, because, for instance, if you take uh, the case of Deleuze, he tried to grind up the infrastructure to input the creativities, to molecularize it. And this could be the meeting point for creativities. Uh, while when we talk today about infrastructure, maybe we delegate reason, idea um, uh, to the technocratic mind. Aren't we doing that? Maybe we could need some other term. That's my question. So you wanted to say something? Yeah, uh, I, I did. Uh, I, um, there's no going back uh, to inhabit in a certain way here, and, and inhabit was a nice word that you chose because, of course, the other way to think, you know, very simply about the spatial fix, is that it was, you know, it was the invasion of the possibility of shelter, as as a place that was sheltering you from capital, right? The spatial fix financializes property and your shelter in such a way that it, it, makes, it makes that precarious. But of course, the history of that, which is the Fordist history of home owning, is, is, is a deeply racialized and co colonized history. It doesn't exist independently. So you have a period in which, historically in the United States, people inherited a, a sense of being settlers in the country especially returning World War II white veterans. They all get loans, they all get houses, and there's a sense of home ownership as this thing outside 
of capital, my safety, my place, etc. Totally racialized, totally you know uh, connected to to the the male wage, which then leverages all the social reproductive labor in and around the neighborhood, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, right? That's gone, and thank fucking God, right? So it's not about going back to that, but even though that's gone, all that stuff is still there, right? I mean, all those houses are still, all, all those things are still there. So it's not a, a matter of good or bad architecture. It's a, it's a matter of good or bad politics. It's a matter of a, a way in which we would, you know, um, in, inhabit together differently these, these kinds of spaces. And that's, you know, um, Fred and I are fond of talking about uh, a certain aspect of the subprime crisis. Uh, because of course these these auditors were watching they always they have all these systems in place to watch when a crisis is developing and in the case of um, the subprime crisis in the u s they missed it it was already they were already in the middle of it before they even knew there was a crisis and that 's because they got a system i 'll simplify it a little bit it basically says that what a person does, but what they really meant is what a settler does that is what someone who believes they have a certain right in terms of land, property, nation, etc. Uh, what they do is they default on their credit card. And then, if they have to, they default on their car. And then, if they have to, they default on their house. In the subprime crisis, people got in their cars with their credit cards and they drove away from the fucking house, right? Left it, right? And they were like, why, why did they do that? Well, they did that because the people who were getting houses in the subprime crisis had a three or four hundred year tradition in the U.S. of understanding shelter as temporary, of, as understanding it as something that's shared, as understanding something that had to be constantly improvised and performed. And so for them, the investment in that house was a totally different order of sociality from which we could learn something about how to inhabit uh, infrastructure that wouldn't force us into divisions of affect versus material or good versus bad uh, infrastructure. So that, that's, why I, that's why I wanted to say too much because we should hear. I think that's, really, that's, that's a really important contribution. And I think that it also gets us away from something that I, I hope is not haunting the edges of this discussion, which is I, I don't think any of it is about being subjects of infrastructure. Right? This, this is not what it's about. It's about finding a whole set of new relations to it, understanding it as an intellectual, political, social, material ground from which we operate, and that we have been precisely so good at molecularizing, you know, at a certain level, but not at, at destabilizing ground at another level. And so this is, is kind of attempting to align I think those practices together. So I think what you've just said is really important. And probably, unless there's something burning, um, we should stop for a bit and give you a chance to get a cup of coffee and continue at um, 7 o'clock with two presentations by two practitioners who are trying to identify infrastructures um, in, at another register. No, because we have to be out of here by 8.45, 7 o'clock. Yeah.